So if you could be here around nine, that would be great. Okay. Well, listen here. Hello, and welcome to 90 Day Fiance MK. I'm Mr. O, and today, Ms. H and I will be discussing season four, episode six of The Other Way. In this episode, we meet Isabel's folks for the first time before Gabe breaks the big news to them. Osama lays out his plan for Debbie's time in Morocco. Nicole wants to skip visiting Mahmoud's family after they fight over clothes again. Jamie's friends think that Chris's court date might be bunk designed to get her back to the States. And Jen makes a serious miscalculation regarding her visa. As always, we'll end with our students of the week, class dances, and life lessons. If you also watch Love After Lockup, you should listen to our other channel, Love After Lockup MK, where we're covering the new season of Life After Lockup. All right, thanks for listening. Stay safe and enjoy. Hello, Mr. O. Hello, Miss H. How are you today? Uh, I was cold this morning, but I know we always talk about that, but man, damn. It's like, uh, I have to be outside, especially this time of year, I have to be outside all the time. Well, tomorrow's the first day of spring, too. You would think it'd be a little warmer. There was frost on my car this morning. Mm-hmm. Unacceptable. Well, thankful for our uh, couples, it's definitely warmer where they are. Yeah, well, let's also talk about the unacceptable uh, couple thing. That's uh, Nicole and Mahmoud. Oh, gosh. So it's now later in the day after their fight, and Mahmoud is feeling that maybe the cultural differences are just too big for him to be the right man for her. So he comes back in the room and says he's sorry he loves her, but I think he's just trying to say whatever it takes to get this conversation to end. (laughs) Um, So they start to argue again, this time about whether or not he really – Wanted her to leave when he was angry and they were fighting or if he was just saying things or then it's about like who plays games in the relationship and blah, 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 blah. So he's like, you know, if I'm such a game player and you think I'm that, why are you around for three years? Like wondering if you should stay with me. What's going on? But then he just needs – then he just says, I just need to stop fighting. So, OK, fine. So Cole feels terrible at how this is going and it's embarrassing that they keep fighting in front of his mom. But to make the peace, he says that, you know, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't even care about what you wore and stuff like that. So you should be like happy that I'm trying to control your clothes options, I think, is what he was going with. But, um, you know, he and, and after all, he must really love her after all this crap. He still doesn't want to let her go. So at this point, mom comes into the room just like holding a phone because – Seems that now they were supposed to, you know, have his meeting with his uncle about their potential business that they were opening. And I'm guessing they're like at this point a couple hours late for this meeting. Yeah. So he's um, – Mahmoud said he considers the uncle to be like a father figure of sorts and it would be super disrespectful just to flake and not go to this meeting. So he doesn't see how they can't go. So it's a cult, it's another cultural difference for her because she says, you know, in America in a fight like this, I would cancel all my social plans. I wouldn't want to see anyone, which – I kind of hate people like that all the time. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I guess in Egypt, her hands are tied and she has to do it. So finally, uh, we get to his Uncle Omar's house. It's very, very late and everyone is still there waiting for them. So he's hoping that since they won't fight, you know, they're not going to fight in front of all these people. Maybe there'll be a chance for everybody to get into a better mood. But they get right down to brass tacks and show Omar the fashion designs, which is what the whole meeting was about in the first place. So he asks what makes her want to go into fashion design, that he being Omar. And she starts to explain how American clothes are so much more revealing and she can't find anything that works for what Mahmoud's as- how Mahmoud's asking her to dress. So she can't figure she can't be the only one facing this problem. So the family thinks that you know what she has in her sketches is a good start and uh, Omar, who owns a clothes factory, thinks actually it's a really good idea. However, there's something missing from all of her sketches, you know, things that cover her hair. So then we get the conversation about why he's just not wearing a hijab anymore. Omar asks why, especially since she was before and now she's not. So Nicole really doesn't want to answer the question. She feels it's way too personal to discuss here. And Omar says, you know, they're not asking for everything right away. But it's really Mahmoud's job to like teach her and the ways of Muslims and what's right and wrong. And eventually she'll come around. That seems like what they're going for, I guess. Mm. So the whole thing is very awkward for her because she just isn't sure if – her problem is actually, you know, the problems she's having mentally are either are with Islam itself or with what Mahmoud's asking her to do. And if that actually comports with um, Islam, she just doesn't know. But I don't know. It just sounds like 
They also get into a conversation about the other things he didn't teach her about Islam, like how to pray. So I just feel like that's coming down the pike anyway. Um, I guess we'll start with that because I mentioned how I don't like it. Man, I just – she reminds me of so many people I know of it that are just like, well, we had a fight. Can't do anything for three days now. Like, And I don't, I don't understand that mentality at all. Right. Um, I think people just don't want to pretend – and they're not very good at pretending. So that's part of it. And I am – and I think it may have also to do with like introverts, extroverts, right? Like uh-huh, I say, maybe. introverts, um, you know, draw their energy from alone time, whereas extroverts uh, draw their energy from people. And so it's like if you're feeling mentally exhausted or mentally drained because of this drama that's happening – in your life, then you're going to want to draw energy from, you know, isolation and canceling all social plans. Whereas I am a more of an introverted extrovert. And so for me, it's like, that's what I need to kind of feel out of that, right? And just to have mm-hmm. some semblance of not having that negativity like around because I, I don't want to sit and stew in my negativity for like right. it's that that's on the same way. It's like this is just gonna get worse if I sit here and like like, yeah, literally stewing it, just cooking my own juices of mm-hmm. my negativity. It's just going to get worse. Um, and maybe it is. Maybe it is introvert, extrovert thing. I'm just like – because to me, the whole thing would be made more stressful because if I'm Mahmoud, I'd just be like, oh, my God, we have to get to my uncles. We have to get to my uncles. Why are we not at my uncles yet? Oh, my God, we just shut up so we can get to my uncles. We have to go now. Like I would just be like that the whole time, like making people right. wait. And flaking on people is like – horrifying to me I, yes. I, I it's like i hate doing it i, I i'm always fra- afraid people will like you know never invite me to do anything again because i flaked on them once and yeah. like and so that's where i don't understand like oh man this whole thing would have been so stressful for me for completely different reasons than right. was stressful for both of them it stresses me out to be late i i don't know if that's a teacher thing or if it's like just has always been a me thing and that's why teacher life is agreeable to me i don't know right but it's like it drives me nuts when i'm running late and it actually it's like a source of stress right i always i always feel this guilt if i feel like people are waiting on me Mm -hmm. and you know or if i feel like i'm gonna be late and then i'm missing something and you know i just it's this sense of like stress that and so like for me if i knew my family was waiting on me and we're having this serious conversation slash argument it's like oh i just want this to be over with so we can go and then figure out this argument later yes and and i guess i wouldn't say it was pretending as much as I, and you're right nicole probably would say it was what are we just supposed to pretend like things aren't mm-hmm. bad Whereas I'm just like – I think of it as car- compartmentalizing. Yes. Like, yeah, we can put that in a little box and put it over here and deal with it later and do the other things we're doing here like getting opinions on my like fashion clothes business that I'm trying to do. I have no – I don't feel like you're pretending like the other problems aren't there if you're just like, all right, well, we're going to table those for now and move on. Although I do think that Maham- Mahmoud, I mean – does that to a ridiculous fault. Well, yeah, because I kind of feel like in his mind, he sees this as just an argument, right? It's not a deal breaker to him. He's just like, whatever, we're fighting again, it'll get resolved. And then we got to think of our future, which is doing this fashion thing. So we got to go to my uncle's house. Whereas I feel like Nicole is coming from a place where she's like, what is the point? If I'm not staying here, I don't give a crap about this fashion thing. Like, why right. do I need to make modest fashion? I don't. I'm out of here, you know? So she's like, let's resolve this thing because it determines whether or not I don't want to do the next thing. And I think he just doesn't see it that way. He just thinks of this as like, oh, some, oh, it's normal. We're fighting again. Like, we'll at some point be okay. We got to move on. And I don't think he realizes that she is taking this very seriously. I mean, I think from what uh, the advice that he gets from his family and stuff just yeah. seems to be like, I mean, it is a deal breaker for him. Mm-hmm. He just doesn't like he it's a, it's not like he would not, you know, let her go around in short sleeve shirts. Right? right. That is an absolute 100 percent deal breaker for him. Um, but the way he resolves it is just like no resolution, no coming to an agreement or talking it through or understanding each other. He's just like, no, I just have to be stubborn for long enough and eventually she'll stop trying. Um, and this is just another instance where we fought for a while and this was a, you know, the like, it, 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 
you know, I, I fought it. I fought against it for a while and now it's time. The, you know, it's like it's like I'm tired of lifting weights. I know I'm just going to keep lifting these weights and put them up and down and eventually my muscles are going to get bigger. But, you know, there's a time to do that for a while. You don't resolve that, you know. And I feel like he feels like this is his – each argument they have is just him doing reps at the weight room. Like I just have to keep doing this, keep at this, stay stubborn, and eventually things will go my way. Well, I think he is also confused why it's gone on this long because I'm sure he's never seen a situation where, you know, if he's in such a patriarchal society and oh, culture sure, sure. where the woman is not relenting. Right. And so I think it's weird for him and he just can't even fathom a world where he doesn't win ultimately. Yes. And so he knows that that's that is his frustration. Since we, we both know that I'm going to win eventually. Mm -hmm. Everybody we talk to tells you I'm going to win eventually. Everybody just advised me just to keep at it and I'll win eventually. So like, why are you doing this? This is annoying. Mm -hmm. Like we know what's going to go on here. And I don't. But then at the end of the day, he's very confused. He's like, but then she left and I don't know why. And it's yeah, like, I, that's the part where I, I think it's just him not being able to fathom, like comprehend that people have different values and beliefs and that right. they are willing to stick up for that instead of just, you know, going along because, you know, that's culturally or what's expected of them. I think he just doesn't comprehend that Nicole is really as independent as she is. Yes. And I do I do kind of get that because I get like <laughs> this is a story when I went to Australia. Right. And it, it's one of those things that are just normal Australia, like the least culturally different one of like the least culturally different places you can go to from America. Right. And it wasn't the culture that was that was an issue. It was like everybody has that accent. Mm -hmm. And I know that everybody has that accent, but subconsciously I just couldn't get rid of the be the the nagging like annoying voice that I know was wrong. That was like they're like doing this to fuck with you. Everybody doesn't talk like that when you're not That's around. So weird. That's such an odd thought. <laughs> when you're not around, they all sound like Americans. It's just they're just doing this now. It's just like why are you all pretending to have this accent? And I know they weren't pretending to have the accent. 100. <laughs> percent I'm like that's a dumb thought, but. So but I think that's what I think with the culture. I think Mahmoud is like at some level his brain is like, why are you pretending to be this independent? We both right. know that you're not. We both sure. know that's not how the world works. I was wondering where you're going with that. I was like, <laughs> what an odd thought. But <laughs> I get that. Yeah, he probably thinks it is like it can't really be like that. But then, I mean, there is, I think, some stock in the idea of if she really was like what you would think of as culturally American, right? Why on earth is she marrying someone who is so different that is going – that she is going to feel oppressed, you know? It's yeah, like, I, 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 I do why would not you do understand. That? Neither of them can get me to understand why <sighs> – they seem like devoted enough to try to keep powering through this. Right. Especially because it seemed that their whole beginning of their relationship was on a whim. You know, they spent a couple days together and all of a sudden, let's get married. OK. Yeah. It, it, I don't I really don't see like even when they talk to each other, that that's the thing. You know, we talked about the, um, you know, what was oh, man, what's the word when the couples fight? And if they have like, you know, a real malice or a real. um. You know, oh. animosity towards each other when they talk. Yeah, like, contempt. Contempt. That's the word. Yes. That's what it is. They have super contempt for each other. Yeah. Like both of them contempt the other person very, very badly when they fight. And that's like this. I don't understand what's going on here. I don't understand why both of them say, well, I must love you a lot to put up with this. It's like, I don't think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm just tired of this couple already. I mean, we're not even yeah. that far in, right? But it's like they have zero range in their storyline. And I just, I fear for us, the audience, that we are going to see the exact same argument played out a hundred, not even different ways. Yeah. The same way a hundred different times. Yeah, the same way. I know we did get the kind of preview thing of her having to wear that bathing suit. Which oh, gosh. Looks pretty funny. Yeah. I'm gonna look sad in my clothes. Like, right, just, right. It, it is a very one note thing, but they're v both very one note people. Like, yeah, yeah. 
well, let's move on to maybe a little bit more range. And that's Debbie and Osama. They're on their way to Rabat, and Debbie is feeling like she's at home in Morocco, and she's feeling young again. While in the car, Debbie's wrap starts slipping off her shoulder, and Osama pulls it back up to keep her covered. Debbie talks to Osama about expectations he has of her as a wife. Osama says that he wants her to be like a half-Moroccan woman, the part where she cooks and cleans. Osama says that his mom will teach her to cook if she has patience. And Debbie seems open to learning and working hard in the home, but she suggests that every once in a while they should get takeout and drink wine. Osama tells her that they can't drink wine at home. Debbie asks if there can be any, like, sneaking, and Osama says that it would be a lie and they are able to drink, just not in the home, because they need to respect their sacred space. Debbie is taken aback that Osama actually wants her to be half Moroccan because they have never discussed this before. Osama takes uh, Debbie to a Riyadh, a house they he called at that particular Riyadh, a house of flowers, because he knows she will like it and be inspired. They have separate rooms since they are unmarried. The courtyard has trees that Debbie thinks is exotic and gorgeous. Osama hits his head on the low-hanging doorframe as he goes to get the luggage. Debbie gets dressed in a princess dress, as she calls it, with a huge lion necklace, and then she goes to the courtyard to talk to Osama. Debbie is telling us that she doesn't want to live with Osama's parents for an indefinite time, but she asks how long they're planning on staying. She wants a specific time frame because she wants to look at apartments in Rabat. Osama says it will be expensive and they will save so much money by staying with his parents. Osama wants Debbie to go back to the U.S. after two months. Osama says that in those two months, Debbie will get to know the family, and that's when he will decide if they should actually get married. Debbie says she wishes he had told her that before she came, because this is all news to Debbie. Osama says that they need to live in reality together, and Debbie thinks that he should have been up front, and this is shocking to her. Debbie didn't realize that this was some kind of two-month test. Osama admits that if he would have been honest, then he knows she wouldn't have come. But Osama says don't not to worry about it. It's going to end up okay. And Debbie tells him, shame on you. And Osama asks why. He was being honest now, and they need to be mm. realistic. Osama says it's not a lie because he does still want to marry her, at least at the moment. And Debbie says she doesn't believe him even as he starts to spout off some poetry. Debbie is mad and she says she's ex exercising a large amount of restraint. Debbie says that the last visit, he took her to the embassy to see what it would take for them to get married then. So how does he go from wanting to get married immediately to this? So Debbie feels like he's changed his mind and she doesn't know him. So she just gets up and walks away. All right, so is were you expecting Osama to kind of pull this? Oh, this is really a test. Um, well, we knew that he he said that he wasn't ready to get married yet. I don't mm. know if he was doing this trial run thing. I don't know that I expected him to be such a condescending ass. Yes, that was what I was like. Whoa, who's this dude? That that yeah. took a turn quickly. Yeah, like very, very like, well, who's being – who's living in – I'm living in reality. You're not, ma'am. Yeah. Like we must live in the reality of the world and this is – I tell no lies. These are no lies. You're – of course, it's like – Yeah, after he admits to lying to her. To lying, yeah. Yeah. He was like, well, if I had told you the truth, you wouldn't have come. It's like, oh my gosh. Right. But the more important, deeper truth is what I'm saying – Right now. And this is the only way we could have reached this truth was through my lie. He's just – it's like I didn't think that we would have the 23-year-old right. like trying to play wise and uh, the wise person in the relationship over the 60-something-year-old. That was yeah. not – that was not on my bingo card. I mean honestly, I thought Debbie when she said she was exercising a large amount of restraint, I was like, Yeah. I mean, she's doing a pretty good job because even when, you know, she was talking to him about, you know, uh, what do you expect from me as a wife? And he starts talking about this half Moroccan woman situation. Uh -huh. She was kind of like, oh, OK. So I was like, oh, she seems to like be going along with it. And then like to us, she's like, wait a second. We never talked about this. So I just feel like he's been saying all these things to her. And I don't know if he 
No, I don't think he's expecting, he didn't expect for her necessarily go along with it. But I think his play now is, well, let's hide the truth from her because I know how this is going to go. She knows the truth. I'll just kind of trick her into this situation and she'll just go along with it later. It's also like a ridiculous thing to think is going to happen. Like, yeah. Like it, 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 to me, it's like okay. If if I brought, you know, we'll see it. We we'll see it with like Jen and Rishi or whatever. And she even she's old. If I bring someone who's my age and kind of get her into the culture and be like, I'm not gonna. Why would you think that somebody who's lived their life, yeah, you know, lived their life, raised their children, you know, had their ex husbands, came that is gonna come marry you and be like, and now I'll spend the twilight years of my life also taking care of you, like right. what? Yeah. Why would why would you expect that? Why would you even think that was on the table? That's crazy. Yeah. Honestly, after seeing this episode, I was like, this is why this guy's single. Right? Oh, 100%. This is why this yeah. guy can't find someone his own age and his own culture. It's like, if he be talking to people like that, yeah, there you go. Yes. Yeah. Like nobody wants nobody wants to to marry the condescending ass. Right. Which is, Especially because, you know, you point out he's 23 years old. Like, my goodness, if I was 23 and dating someone who else who was 23 and he talked to me like that, even I would have enough sense at, at a young age to be like, nope, I'm out. Yeah. I don't need I don't need a freaking sensei to tell me the ways of the world. Like, what are you doing? You're 23. Yeah. Like, and I mean, it's funny, though, because you could tell. I don't know how much she um, is just into saying his name all the time yeah. or if it was just a like mom thing where, you know, the matter she got, the more she kept saying the, his actual name. But like the number of times she was like, oh, Sama, oh, my goodness, I can't believe that you would do this. Oh, Sama. It's <laughs> like, oh, my gosh, why is she saying his name like that all the time? Wow. Yeah. Uh, Debbie, run away. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I I mean, as goofy as she is, I, I, I – she's been down this road before and it's like – and I think this is kind of – I don't know, but she goes down it again, right? She said she's had, she's had two other ba- bad relationships that, are, that have ended in divorce and, you yeah. know, but they did both – it were like cheating related, not like – Treating her like crap related or treating her as inferior related. Yeah, but I think it's all kind of like a symptom of the same thing, right? It's these people are mistreating her, not respecting her, treating Mm -hmm. her uh, as an equal, you know, so. Yep. All right. So moving along, let's talk about Chris and Jamie. So it doesn't look like Chris is feeling any better and any better today. And Jamie is bringing her some water and... As she says, candy, which I assume are just pills. I don't know. I can't say pills or meds or something, but okay. (laughs) So the shot from the doctor uh, that we saw last episode didn't really give her much help. So Jamie had planned to have dinner with friends, but, you know, Chris is in no condition to go and tells Jamie she should go without her. Jamie isn't crazy about this idea, but maybe Chris needs her to be out of the house a little bit for for some time to rest. So this is supposed to be the dinner where Chris met her friends, the ones, you know, the friends. I think it's the same friends we met from the beauty salon before. I think so. So they – when she gets there, they immediately ask why Chris is missing. So she tells um, them that Chris is back, bad neck and tells them the whole story about the car accidents and how she's not doing well. And they ask how – Jamie, how she's feeling about things so far. And really, she's just like, well, it's kind of hard to see her in like this much pain. So uh, the friends are a little worried that – what had happened was, and what's going on here is that Chris got here and got cold feet and is kind of using this pain as an excuse maybe. So they start talking about the wedding date, which is another thing that is kind of come up for Chris. So they talk, she tells him about the – about how the wedding date might need to get pushed because of the whole rare motorcycle case and uh, they're going to find out – it seems like they'll find out tomorrow whether or not uh, Chris has to go back to the States to make an appearance in court. Or if she can you know, sign an affidavit or something like that that she wouldn't have to go back for. So the friends, yeah, not a fan. They think that this – they they seem to think Chris is lying and this is just an excuse for her to be able to get, to go back to the States so that she can ghost uh, Jamie and not come back. So they think if Jamie's not careful, she may end up heartbroken. Uh, but I guess Jamie is kind of just like, I guess we'll find out tomorrow, uh, especially since she has her doubts with uh, Chris's history of disappearing. So – uh, I mean, I guess I didn't 
think of it as a whole cloth lie before, but I mean, these friends definitely seem to think the motorcycle story is just like bullshit from top to bottom. It um, does sound really weird, you know, and I would also be suspicious too, like because it's like you haven't even been there for a week and you're already talking about how you need to leave. And so it's like that can't be an emergency, right? She had to have known this Michael motorcycle thing was at least in the works on the horizon, something that could have potentially happened. And if you really legitimately thought that this was going to like be a thing once you postpone your trip it like causes more visa yeah. complications like it just it doesn't make any sense to me and it does seem really suspicious that it's like oh surprise like last minute you have two days to come back here to be part of uh, a trial right it doesn't it doesn't pass the sniff test because those date those courts are backed up so bad right yeah, now that right. those things are set months like sure. months, months, months in advance. There was one case I was like looking at because, you know, for some reason I knew somebody was on jury duty and was like keeping track of it. But that was like – there was like a mistrial or something. And they're like, all right, we'll set a new date for the mistrial. And I was like – and it's in September and yeah. this happened in like like February. And I'm like right. it's months in advance. Yeah. Right? And so the idea – yeah, the idea that she would know. Now, I do think that there's a possibility that – and she didn't explain it like this, so I maybe I'm maybe I'm reading too much into it. Maybe I'm giving her too much of the doubt. Where she knew the case was this day, she knew the trial was this day, but she had no idea that she had to physically be present there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe she had a signed affidavit, maybe she had videotaped, uh, uh, you know, testimony or something that that she that, that was supposed to be used. And they're like, oh no, you have to be there. It doesn't seem. That's likely, but I mean, at least that seems a little bit more like a possibility. Instead, well, they just made the court date two days from now. That doesn't pass the sniff test. Right. Well, I feel like just in general, if this was so important to you, and it certainly sounds like it is, like this is something that you probably would have wanted to get more information about. And regardless, it's like literally seven days past the day that she was supposed to be in Colombia. Like, why don't you just postpone your trip by seven days like it makes no sense to me if this was such an important event well i i mean i know why she if if my my suspicion there would be that jamie would be like oh if you're gonna postpone it by seven days you might as well not come like you're ghosting me again i know what's already i know what's going on you're gonna do it seven days and then seven days later it's gonna be seven more days and it's gonna be a month and then you're never going to get here. Yeah. Well, we still don't know why Chris ghosted her in the first place. And so it's right. like, until I know that, I am. I'm going to be just as as suspicious as Jamie. Because what is to stop her from just randomly ghosting? I mean, she offered zero explanation when she came back. Right. We had, we, get, we got nothing. It's, it's yeah. I mean, that's, it's just a lot of, a lot of weirdly suspicious. Oh, yeah. This is just have to go. And the. The thing has to go. But but it, it doesn't even seem like Jamie knew about the case at all. Like, no, nah, you know what confused. I'm saying? If it was like, oh, man, this my motorcycle got stolen. You'd think you would that, you'd think if you had someone that was a significant other to the point where you were like the, contemplating marrying them, that your $50,000 motorcycle that you needed to ha- that you were going to use to help fund things got stolen. Like that would be a topic of conversation, right? They oh, would have yeah. known about this already. And the fact so. that she sp- sprung the entire case on her. Like, laying in his bed in the store is like, well, this is a random thing that came out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's certainly many things for the friends to be suspicious about. Yeah. I mean, it definitely is. I mean, if, if you don't really know somebody to be like, well, this is a person I'm afraid might ghost me. It happened before. Yeah. And like, the, you're like, well, how are things going? Well, she might have to go back. And it's like, oh, she's ghosting you again. Right. Like, like, open your eyes. Like, you know, I. it's one of those things that like. That you get that external perspective. Anybody, I think, externally for that would be like, yeah, she's not coming back. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, quite honestly, if I were Jamie, I'd be like, mm, maybe this is for the best. Right? Yeah. Like, and not I mean, to that's say, definitely a sign. Yeah. But not to say, like, you know, they should break up. But, like, for me, if I were Jamie, I'd be like, oh, I need to know this woman a lot better because – If we are to take what we've seen as her experience with Chris, like, in real life, that doesn't Mm -hmm. seem like fun. That doesn't seem like a relationship I would want to be in. You know, it's like, 
I get that, you know, there are challenges and trials and tribulations in a relationship and, you know, you're supposed to be a partnership and help them, you know, when they're struggling and having medical issues, you know, in sickness and in health. But it's just like, it seems like a lot. Like, what has she brought to the table during this visit that's like, yeah, this is my girl. Right. I mean, even even you you take out the the, the medical stuff, right? Mm-hmm. She's brought um, random drama with knives. Not yeah, that. <laughs> but random drama. There's random knives. Um, drama with court cases uh-huh. and like insecurity. Like it's pretty much all she's brought to the right. table, absent the neck injury, which I'm not gonna judge her over the neck right? injury the threat of getting punched in the middle of the night having weird allergies to things like just being generally uncomfortable or in pain the entire time it's like i don't know if we've actually seen them enjoying each other's company yeah i mean and i, I if you're injured you're injured right yeah. I, I, but and there's nothing like chris can do about that but i mean it does seem like it's a bigger impact of the relationship than 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 Jamie was led to believe, mm-hmm. if, if we could put it that way. Right, because it really honestly seems like it is the focus of their relationship is how can we make Chris feel better? And yeah. that just seems like a lot, you know? It's like, because it's like Jamie is always going to be the one to have to give if it continues the way that it is. And mm-hmm. there's some part of that where it's like, well... You know, it's the way it is because Chris doesn't have much to give in her situation, but right. If it, but right, yeah, right. But right now, the entire relationship revolves around what Chris needs. Yeah, and that's yeah, that's tough. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, let's move on to Gabriel and Isabel. So we have probably the most playful intro we've had with any couple on this. Yeah, they do the dancing yeah, franchise it's, it's with Gabe and Isabel shaking their booties and. So we get a scene with Gabe playing basketball with his English-speaking friend from Miami, Trey. Trey is asking what his plan to stay is, and Gabe says he's planning on proposing and a ring is on his to-do list. Gabe doesn't feel like this needs much thought because he's already jumped all the way in. Trey points out that, you know, there could be just a honeymoon phase and that Isabel has shown signs of possessiveness and jealousy. Trey thinks that she's jealous of him and doesn't want to lose his friendship with Gabe over her. Gabe says he's going to ask Isabel's dad for permission when he goes to visit. He drops the bomb on Trey on camera that he's trans. And Trey is like super genuinely shocked because Gabe plays football. He's supportive (laughs) and Gabe says now they can be social media friends. Gabe brought it up because he wants to tell her parents and then wanted to talk to Trey about it. Trey thinks telling them he's trans and asking for marriage all in one conversation is just too much. And he points out that the machismo culture here uh, isn't going to make it easy for him to be accepted. Gabe wants to rip off the Band-Aid and hopes the best for the reaction. Later, Gabe and Isabel are meeting up with their friends, and Isabel tells Gabe that she doesn't like Trey because he's a womanizer. He's with a new woman every time and thinks that he's a bad influence on Gabe. Trey, who's there at their friend hangout, says that it's their place as Gabe tries to shush him. And Isabel gets annoyed and insists to know what they're like trying to talk about. Uh, And if he doesn't tell her, then that's it. She's going to leave. Gabe just keeps saying it's nothing. He doesn't want her to know that he goes there with Trey because uh, Isabel is afraid Gabe will leave her for an English speaking woman And since a lot uh, frequent the place, she doesn't like him going there without her. Trey then asks if Gabe is ready for this, you know, implying, you know, being tied to Isabel. And Gabe tells him to shut up. And Trey just confronts Isabel and asks why she doesn't like him. Isabel says it's because he's a bad influence. And when they're together, they are liars. Isabel insists on knowing what the secrets are. Gabe says he wants them just to be friends. And Isabel reluctantly agrees. Finally, Isabel's friend Mateo shows up, which relieves Gabe. Mateo can tell there's tension. Trey actually manages to lighten the mood a bit by saying that he just found out a big secret about Gabe. The focus then shifts to Gabe telling uh, Isabel's dad, you know, how that's going to go. 
We find out that Isabel's dad is very religious, which has made Gabe terrified because he tells us he gets the most negative reactions and hate online from trolls and religious people. Mateo asks what will happen if Isabel's dad makes her choose between the two of them. And then Gabe asks her to choose him because he moved there for her. Isabel is worried because her parents have been right about her relationships in the past and they will assume that they're just right again. So later, uh, the kids, Gabe and Isabel, all pack up to, vis to visit Isabel's parents. Isabel says she's nervous and happy to see her parents. She says that their reaction to the news could affect their future. Gabe hugs her dad as her dad is picking him up, and Isabel's dad already liked Gabe because he says that he's respectful and thinks that he's special. Isabel's dad asks that they sleep in separate rooms, which they're okay with because Gabe jokes that, you know, Isabel snores. They sit down to dinner, and Dad says a prayer calling Gabe a new member of the family. Dad is surprised to hear that Gabriel is not moving back to Miami, which leads him to ask about their future. Gabriel says that he wants to spend the rest of his life with Isabel. The kids give their ringing endorsement to the relationship, and Isabel's parents have a lot of hope that Gabriel will make Isabel happy. Her dad does say that God needs to be in Gabriel's heart, as Gabe just kind of, like, looks uncomfortable and doesn't really know how to react to all this religious speak yeah okay so isabel's dad seems to love gabe like yeah really really love gabe um i feel like a lot of times uh people who are so against another group of people it's because they haven't known someone Right. And so yes, it's definitely sure. mm -hmm. a prejudice because they're prejudging the people. Right. But now that, you know, Gabe's uh, or sorry, Isabel's dad could, you know, actually put a face to, you know, a group of people. Do you think that he will, you know, disapprove of Gabe? I mean, I don't know. I, I, I... I kind of think they're faking us out a little bit on this. I mm -hmm. think, especially after we saw um, the way they interacted together. Yeah. Um, th that, that I mean, how much he, he likes Gabe, how much of a sweetheart he, the dad is. Yeah. Like, the dad is really a sweetheart. Like, yeah. um, that I don't know that it's going to be as much of an issue as they were worried about it being, mm -hmm. right? And especially because the dad doesn't come across as – um, like we had a similar situation with Kenny and Armando, right. right? Armando's dad was a very masculine man who had yeah. like I very seemed to have very strict ideas about what the roles of men were and the men. Right? He was right. He also just seemed grumpy, like and I mean, also a grumpy man. Yeah, I don't yeah, know for if sure. that had to do with the context of how he was on the show, but he seemed like one of those like quiet grumpy men. Yes. Right. And so, I mean, it, it looked like a harder build. This one, I mean, he can see that like I mean, Gabe is – I mean, Gabe's a man, but he's not like a super macho, like kick you in the ass. I'm going to be over here grumping and blah, man, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of why he likes him is I think the other guys that Isabel has been with or brought home or did mm -hmm. anything or had children with has been that kind of man, like super macho – uh, you know, things. And he's like, well, those guys all treated her like shit and she's worse off. Like, but Gabe plays football. I mean, how how much more manly can you get? <laughs> <laughs> but I did. It, 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 but I, he talks to them like he right. is like actually involved in conversations and things like that. Yeah, he plays football like <laughs> I was like, OK, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Yes. So he couldn't possibly be trans. He plays football. <laughs> <It's> like, okay, <laughs> okay, Trey. <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel like that this speaks to a little bit more. But, but I, I you know, I get the idea of it. Like he, it's it, he's Gabe is a much more sensitive guy mm -hmm. than he's used to than that her dad's used to seeing already, right? Yeah. And I, I won't lie, I think, I think, unfortunately and sadly, most anti-trans feelings and i'm sure i'm not going to say gabe has not gotten a lot of shit for mm -hmm. being trans they all ever i'm sure he has mm -hmm. but it's i feel like it's trans women get more crap like you honestly think so? okay yeah like i think I, I think 
Yeah, I do. I, I think because because you know it all started. The, remember the the first stupid like culture war thing they came up with was the was the bathroom bills, right? Right. And it was all like, oh, so a guy can just say he's a woman and go into bath, go into women's bathrooms now, right? That yeah. seemed to be like the issue. No, nope. and I was all like, you'd rather have somebody that looks like Gabe like going into the women's room because. That matches his at birth gender. Like I, I remember thinking this at the time when right. I first started this culture war thing. Well, I'm like that seems dumb. You kind of think about, I think more traditionally, you get men are a little less accepting generally. I mean, I hate to generalize, and it's For like sure. I feel like men are very much into that. Well, I don't want to be tricked into trying to date someone who's trans, whereas. I feel like oh, women yeah. would be a little bit more accepting of that scenario. So maybe that's why you get that it's more difficult. Oh, I, I can see that. I can see that. Because, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's tends to be men. Men tend to get more emotionally reactive to things. Mm-hmm. So you're like, I don't like the idea that I could find somebody hot and then later find out that they're – a tr- they're trans mm-hmm. like that. They're like triggers a lot of guys for some reason. Oh, yeah. Whereas, like yeah, that's sure. not really that's not really something that's going to happen for straight guys with trans men. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I, I so I wouldn't be I do. I do. I'm hoping and thinking it's kind of mostly a lot of setup for something that's going to end up not being as big of a deal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right, so going on to oh my goodness, oh, Jen goodness, and Rishi. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Whew. So Jen and Rishi are on their way some way, some quiet place to discuss things. It's outside, so it's only so quiet. Namely, the thing the thing they want to discuss is where is how Jen, after wife training, has decided, yeah, she's not gonna be able to live in a joint family. She, that's not gonna happen. So she starts by telling him that she doesn't feel like he's been compromising on anything after she gave up everything to be here. So he kind of in like a roundabout way of allowed like, well, I have the love for the things in my family and blah, uh, kind of asks her what kind of compromise is she looking for from him. And she says, tells him it's uh, my compromise is I don't want to live with your family. So he says that it's a big deal to live on their own. And when she asks if it's a deal breaker – he doesn't like answer immediately, but after a few like back and forths of him thinking in his own head, uh, does say he's willing to do that for her. So he also tells her that when she w- – he also tells her when she asks that he is ready to put his foot down with his family. He will tell them what what about it. And he says, this is my girl and blah, 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 blah. This is what we're doing. So in an interview, he says he loves her enough that he wants to, t- he wants to you know, face his family, but also – he doesn't know how he's going to be able to bring himself to do it. So in return, he asks her for one thing, and that's uh, that she give him time to break things to his family. And she says, OK, here's a few months. I'll wait until the summer. And she's hoping he's just not stringing her along. So then Jen's next move is to get to a lawyer to make sure she does her visa run correctly. She thinks she's on a four-month visa and needs to leave the country every 30 days. So the lawyer takes a look at the visa and explains that uh, and she kind of explains that she wants to do a visa run to a nearby country because her fiance is here and she doesn't want to go all the way back to the States. Even, even sure, she's pretty sure they're going to end up married. But the lawyer looks at the visa and sees, says, uh, I think you missed something because this is not a four month multiple entry visa. This is a 30 day single entry visa. So, uh, when you leave the country, you're going to have to reapply for another tourist visa. So, the lawyer then says in an interview that this is just crazy American behavior. <laughs> you come on a visa to marry somebody <laughs> without even knowing you were getting married on the wrong visa and just stupid Americans. So he tries to be – she tries to be proactive and asks like, well, how long could we – could we get this started now? How long would it get to get another tourist visa? And he's like, I don't know. There's a lot of backlog. They could take you know a couple months, could take a long time. Says the best course of action is just to go back to the U.S. and and start the process over. So she calls it the worst news yet, and seems that like everything in the universe is making things harder than it needs to be. So they say the lawyers say there's actually two there that if you know they were about to be married, they had a date or something for the wedding, they could, might be able to work something out. But if it's not in like 15 to 20 days, like that's too long. You're gonna have to go back. So she's devastated, but says that. Uh, because she says that what she really needs to for you know to figure out what she's doing is more FaceTime with Rishi, but now they're gonna have to go back to having like 
FaceTime on the iPhone instead of real FaceTime. So then she cries about it in the cab back to the hotel. So now we know that she only has six days left in her visa and she has to go break the bad news to Rishi. So she, they have some chai together and she tells him what the lawyer told her and what he advised and she starts crying while she's doing it. So she's worried that if she goes back to her family and friends, they're just going to put extra pressure on her to stay in the States. So Rishi doesn't want to lose her over some dumb visa mistake and this is – but is it still going to be like more years of waiting? So this throws a whole wrench into their plans and then even he starts to cry a little bit. Jen says they tried the long distance thing before and it was hard um, but it's going to be harder because now she knows when she's in the US that his family is going to be like trying to marry him off like ASAP. OK. So you have traveled a lot more internationally than I have. Is it that hard to read the visa to figure out like how long no. it lasts? No. No. <laughs> I don't understand. Like – but OK. But that being said, I also – haven't had a situation where I needed a visa that wasn't like a visitor visa, right? right and so true. a visitor sure. visa, most of the countries that I've been to, like I don't really have to do a whole lot before. Uh, you just go and then you have like 90 days and you have to kind of show proof that you're leaving. I think it gets a lot more complex when you're just buying a one-way ticket because they do want mm. some kind of proof like – you're leaving, right? You're not going to overstay your visa. So that's when uh, they don't really like things like that. But um, this is certainly something that should have been figured out before. It's like, well, what kind of visa did you get exactly? You know, like, yeah. was this a fiance visa? Like, at least in America, it's very clear. It's like, well, if you have a fiance visa, that's a specific type of visa. If you have a student visa, that's a specific type of visa. An employment visa, you know, a visitor visa. These are all different. How do you not know what kind of visa you have and the terms of your visa? I mean, I know people who uh, just go on a visitor visa and they'll do like um, what she was kind of talking. They call them visa runs, right? Where you just you just have to leave the country every 30 to 90 days, depending on, you know, what the setup is there. And then you just pay, pretty much like re-enter the country and it restarts the clock. And I think for some reason she thought that she could do that. And the guy was like, no, the visa you have, you can't come back in. And it's just like, wow, how did you not figure this out before? Were you trying to like just do it on your own? And then also it's like, I feel bad for her because this is kind of like a Jenny Summit situation. Like Jenny kind of had to do the same thing because Summit wouldn't marry her. If he married her, right. then she could stay. So same thing. I think Jen was under the impression that – her and Rishi would be getting married soon. And so she didn't think this was a problem. So I can understand why she maybe wasn't paying too much attention to the details of her visa. No, I could see I could see some situation where because she was here two years ago, right? Yeah. That that she I could see a situation, I'm making this up, I'm filling in a lot of blanks, where like, yeah, two years ago, oh, you get a visa and it lasts for four months. You can come and go as many times as you want. Right. But you have to leave every 40 days. Yeah. And then she goes, this time you get the visa. And they're like, well, you already had the four-month visa within five years. So we're just going to give you a 30-day tourist right. visa. And she just assumed it was the same visa. Yeah. Right? And and it was just like, oh, okay. So that's the same visa I had before. So I'm good to go. And she was not good to go and didn't like pay that much attention to it. Well, I feel like also like if she was really that confident about it, she probably wouldn't have gone to a lawyer. So right. it yeah, seems yeah, to me sure. like it, if I was so unsure about something that I was going to a lawyer, you best be believe that I would have paid attention and read front to back like everything, right? So it just seems like weird that it's like you seem unsure. That's why you're going to a lawyer in the first place. But then it's also a news and surprise when the lawyer tells you what's up. Yes, because it seems like if you – you would have seen the lawyer before you went, yeah. right? Like if you're like, I'm not sure how to interpret this. I'm going to see a lawyer about it. Um, yeah, because it didn't seem like – like she went at first and was like, why are you at a lawyer? Shouldn't you be a travel agent? She's like, I got to figure out what nearby country I can go to. Um, and I think that's maybe what she thought she could do is just figure out like, well, which nearby country is it legal? Will my visa run count, mm -hmm. right? And they were like, mm, none. none of them. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And so now she's like stuck here. And like I don't know because I'm also – I'm also doubtful about, about Rishi be, doing what he said on his mm -hmm. end of the bargain. Like 
do you really think he's going to actually tell his family and actually put the foot down no. and like do all that? Or yeah, no. <laughs> he literally was like, he seemed so scared to do it. To oh, just yeah. be like, well, I have to tell no, my family. He was like, that. I told her I do that, but I have no idea how I'm going to do this. Yeah. No, I don't see him doing that either. All right. Uh, goodness. These two. Okay. So I'm a little confused. Do we not have an episode next week? Because it seemed like they did like kind of a mid-season trailer. They totally did a mid-season trailer. Yeah. But I did look it up and they do have an episode next week. So that like very much confused me because I feel like they tend to do that when it's like there's a break. Yes. Because they're really trying to keep you like engaged for longer than a week when they're gone. Right. This isn't going to happen. Uh, I mean, I feel like they do it sometimes when there's a break and sometimes, and I'm bracing myself, when there's a really boring episode coming up. Oh, and they're like, well, there's not enough footage in this episode to make a whole next time on thing. We better just do the rest of the season. Oh, well, I feel like, oh, yeah, I was going to say, I feel like uh, maybe they should do that after the boring episode, right? Because you were like, I'm not tuning in next yeah, week. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I, I yeah I see what you're saying though. Um, yeah, because it seems like based on the trailer, it seems like Chris and Jamie are actually getting married, which I'm like, yeah. oh god, no. But then it looks like Jamie leaves. I mean, Chris leaves after they're married. Yes, and it also seems like she may have ghosted her, <laughs> which I'm just like, oh goodness, yeah. Um, what else did uh, I recall seeing? Uh, I guess Danielle and Johan were in it again. Um, it seemed like, oh, Osama and Debbie seemed to have kissed and made up at least to have some rock and fun. Sure, sure. Well, then they leave us, I remember they just leave us with Gabe, like, saying I'm trans. Yeah. And then, like, like, hanging it. Like, hang, like, no no reaction, which is fine. That's pretty much what we're tuning in to see is what's the reaction to that going to be. Right. Yeah, so, bunch of things going on. All right, so out of the group you saw this week, who would you say was your student of the week? Uh, my student of the week was Jamie. Mm-hmm. Um, just, I mean, mostly by default because I thought everybody else had like glaring flaws in what yeah. they were doing. Yeah. But at least she is, she's A, doing her best to take care of her partner as she is here, but also B, recognizing that this is a precarious situation. Right, right. Um, I actually went with Debbie. When she said it took the largest amount of restraint, I was like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah, I give you that. Yeah. But, and I, I just I appreciated that she got her point across without being explosive and stupid. You know, because mm-hmm. a lot of times, you know, people do that. They react very poorly to something and just make things work. But or, I mean, worse but right. I felt like Debbie communicated exactly what was bothering her. And, yes. you know, it it wasn't in a way that was provoking him. Although Osama is my dunce because dude's an idiot, like, and just disrespectful, like conniving, I would even say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was he was yeah lying, bordering on gaslighting. Mm-hmm. I was like, what well, did we ever say that? Did we? I, Of course, you, you were the one who assumed that. I was like, eh, right. I don't know about that. Yeah. Uh, all right. So my, my dunce was Jen. Mm-hmm. Just stupid. Like dumb. Like she, And especially because like she's one that doesn't seem that dumb yeah. at first. Yeah, and yeah. like the more we learn about her, I'm like, she might be really dumb. Like, <laughs> And especially this 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 whole passport thing combined with her like I don't know the way I don't know I just, not expecting the joint family thing at all it seems a little it's super naive and right. so like it just a lot of stuff on top of each other yeah yeah definitely all right tell what about your life lesson uh my life lesson is just I guess it's at like. Mahmoud and Nicole, like if you have, if you find yourself having literally the same argument with the same beats over and over again, and it's impacting your life, yeah, like you got to find a way to at least change the steps of the dance, like change the parameters of the argument or something, right? Like it's either never going to work, and you just need to accept that, but you can't just keep having the same fight over and over again and letting it like end your social life, yeah. 
definitely. Uh, so my life lesson is for Osama and people mm-hmm. like Osama. Be honest. If you feel like the truth will get an outcome that you that you don't want, then that's probably what should happen. Yeah, you. That's. It, it, we've heard it before, and that's always a pet peeve of both of ours. When mm. you say, "Well, if I would have told you the truth, you'd have been mad, or you would have." chosen not to come and it was like yeah. then you really should have told them that right and given them the opportunity to not to make their own choice because you took that choice away from them yeah. by lying <sighs> so terrible all right so we will be back next week hopefully with a interesting episode because now you got me scared oh yeah but <laughs> that might be boring well if we can get i mean if we can just get more of nicole looking sad in her uh full cover-up bathing suit i think we'll be pretty good Maybe we'll get multiple things of that. Maybe she'll start wearing a headscarf. I don't know. Oh, man. All right. So until then. All right. See everybody then. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye.